Uh, as I said yesterday, it is a true pleasure to introduce Paul Ortiz. Paul and I first worked together when we, among many others, built the program and events around the 48th Annual Oral History Association meeting, which was held in October 2014 here in Madison. So I know Paul exclusively as an oral historian and like me as an oral, and also like me as an oral history program director. He and I both direct programs uh, at, our, at our respective universities. And in our field, both in his teaching and his writing, as I said when I introduced him last, at last month's OHA annual meeting at one of our plenary sessions, uh, Paul speaks truth to power. So yesterday I enjoyed uh, learning so much about Paul's non-oral history research by listening to the lecture. If you missed yesterday's lecture, you can see it and hear it on the Haven Center website. Uh, so yesterday Paul gave us an overview of the first half of his upcoming monograph, An African American Latinx History of the United States. Did I get that right? Got it. Okay. Uh, and while yesterday he focused on the 19th century, uh, today he continues his assault on the idea of American exceptionalism, bringing his ideas and arguments into the 20th century and today. Yesterday I forgot one of my mantras. Uh, it comes from my 14-year-old daughter, Ainsley. Whenever her friends are over and I try to be the cool dad, engaging them in conversation, she reminds me, and never subtly, Dad, no one is here to hear you. So, Paul Ortiz, an associate professor of history and the director of the award-winning Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. Today's talk is entitled, Killed, Helping Workers to Organize, African American and Latina Latino Narratives in the Century of Jim Crow, Juan Crow. So please join me again in welcoming Paul Ortiz. Well, thank you again for, for having me. And um, as Troy mentioned, you know, we did an event yesterday. We're on a historical journey um, we're trying to re-envision American history for the 21st century. We talk about values like inclusivity, democracy, diversity, multiculturalism, but what does that mean? So yesterday, we talked about how you have to leave the United States in certain ways to actually come to learn what the United States is, what it has been, and what it might be in the future. And I shared my personal odyssey going abroad, serving as a soldier, um, being in Central America, going throughout the Global South, and learning probably more about the United States in those two years when I was in Seven Special Forces than I did in the preceding 18 years growing up <laughs> in a country I thought I knew. Uh, but we have to understand this is an experience that so many people in this hemisphere in the Americas have had vis-a-vis -vis their own countries. Whether you were born in Mexico, as many of my students are first generation, and when I taught at Santa Cruz I had many first generation Mexican immigrant students who would talk about the reverse process feeling they didn't really know their country, their native country, until they came to the U.S., or until they came to Canada, and then began thinking about it, and then maybe returning, maybe not returning, depending on what was happening in the broader arena. So what I want to do today is just do a little brief review in the very beginning to kind of bring folks who weren't here yesterday up to speed, and then move, as Troy mentioned, into the 20th century, um, where things are very exciting, um, a lot of things are changing, um, and nothing is static. And the first slide I have here, and I, I won't read these slides, but essentially the idea that I'm trying to get across in the book is that my attempt to re-envision American history, and again, this is part of a series of, of several books. Uh, the first two titles were, um, the first title was A Disability History of the United States, re-envisioning American history through the perspectives of people who deal with disabilities. Uh, the second title was an LGBT history of the United States. The third was uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's uh, Indigenous Peoples History of the United States. So mine is an African American and Latinx history of the United States. We use the term Latinx to try to move beyond gender binaries uh, in, our, in our various diasporas. Um, but the C.L.R. James quote here, politics is an activity, I've been thinking about this a lot in the wake of Tuesday's um, election, the whole long presidential election season. What James is trying to get across here is that politics is not a spectator sport, as much as we've been trained to see it as a spectator sport. 
what he's trying to get across is politics is an activity, and the more active people are, the more active their government can be in helping them deal with the problems they have to deal with, whatever, whatever those problems are. In other words, there's no savior. There's no one person, there's no 20, there's no thousand people that we can elect to office who are going to help solve our everyday problems. But this, this idea comes out of James's work in the anti-colonial movement. And much of what I'm trying to do in re-envisioning American history is emphasize the role of social movements in creating social change, social justice organizing in the United States. And by way of doing a bit of review, but also moving forward, I want us to kind of flash or kind of focus in on two events which are essentially getting to, to the core of what we mean by re-envisioning American history as a history of social movements. Okay, Thinking about politics, not just who happens to be president of the United States, whether it's Andrew Jackson or Barack Obama or Donald Trump, but what's happening at the grassroots? What's happening where you and I live to create change or to oppose change? So these are two images from two very important moments in American history. And I wonder if anyone, maybe one of the, the students can take a shot at telling me about or telling us about these moments, maybe trying with the, the first one on the left. Does anyone have any guesses about what that image depicts or what it's trying to depict? <coughs> Yes? Is it supposed to be Harriet Tubman guiding slaves through a swamp? Yes, Harriet Tubman, excellent. Harriet Tubman guiding slaves through a swamp. They're escaping from slavery. Um, excellent. What about the second image? Any guesses about that image? That's his 2006 May Day. This was a national general strike called by people primarily of Latin American descent uh, in the Southwest, Mexican American organizations led. It was a national general strike. But both of these, these images depict the two national general strikes that have been waged in American history. We've had a lot of general strikes. What is a general strike? It's a strike where all the workers were trained to see this all the workers in a city or a region go out on strike, regardless if they're steel workers, garment workers, teachers, or whatever. Everyone goes out on strike. These are two moments in American history. The American Civil War, when African Americans go out on a general strike. And we first learn to see the American Civil War as a general strike through the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, Black Was Reconstruction. It 50th May? What's that? Was it 50th May? Cinco de Mayo is connected to this in Mexico. Mm -hmm. That's very good. I love that connection. And, mm -hmm. and we can talk about there uh, during QA. Um, because African Americans see the French invasion of Mexico as tied to what's happening in the American Civil War. Um, and I talk about this in, in the book. But that, that depiction of Harry Tubman, what was Harry Tubman doing during the Civil War? She was working in the Union Army. Right? She was leading, she led troops into battle. A lot of people don't realize this. But what's, what Du Bois is arguing is that in the middle of the Civil War, what's changing everything, what changes Abraham Lincoln's mind, because he begins with this idea that if I have to maintain slavery in order to maintain the Union, I will do it. Frederick Douglass tells him from the very outset, you can't fight the war with one hand tied behind your back. President Lincoln. They become very good friends. It's one of the, the amazing friendships in American history. Um, Lincoln is taught and trained to change his mind and to move towards the Emancipation Proclamation because enslaved African Americans began leaving the plantations in mass, volunteering for the Union Army, not just as soldiers, but working as cooks, as ditch diggers, as laborers, as nurses, as and, and in all different capacities. And Lincoln realizes that if we're going to win the war, 
this is this is it. This is going to be the, the pivot. And he's taught, you know, it isn't just that Lincoln comes up with this idea. He's being taught by the American working class who were enslaved that this war, in fact, is about slavery. And if we're going to win the war, if we're going to keep the Union together, we have to abolish slavery. And towards the end of the war, he's he's pushed by a lot of politicians and reporters who think he's not serious. And they say, President Lincoln, when the war is over, you're going to reinstitute slavery, right? And he's like, take 180,000 men out of uniform and put them back in the plantations. We might as well just quit right now. We might as well just quit the war. Are you nuts? Are you crazy? You know, you don't understand what's been happening in this country. But again, that's Lincoln's insight. He's pushed it out from the grassroots, from escaped slaves moving and changing history. Um, the May Day general strike in 2006, I argue in the book, we called it in California, by the way, a day without Mexicans. Uh, because we were always told, we can do without you. We don't want you in California. Get out. This is our state. And so we kind of called their bluff and said, okay, we're going to not show up for work one day and see how you guys like it. It was surprising how effective it was. But that event, the May Day General Strike, I argue in the book, and that's part of my last chapter, makes possible the election of Barack Obama. The momentum it creates is a new generation of Latino leadership in very large labor unions and labor federations from Las Vegas West who are the first major endorsers of Senator Obama in the Democratic primary. Now I'll move forward from that. Um, again, just to kind of Can quick you review. Just mention why, why the strikers chose May 1st. Maybe. Why they chose May 1st? Just, just one sentence. Just May 1st is International Workers' Day, and we have a labor scholar with us. At, um, and it was important for a number of different reasons. One is, it was a day in which we felt that we could garner kind of mainstream labor support, at least in places like California. Um, but it was tremendously effective. Millions of people went out on strike that day. Uh, but it's, it's historically International Workers' Day. And there's also an older May Day tradition, of course. Yes. Another fellow to us uh, we have here in Wisconsin, Dia de Wisconsin Sin Latinos. Right. And you had Madison completely full with Latinos. Yeah. You have come Latinos. So it's a really parallel to what you were saying. National. I know. I, I got a call. It didn't surprise me that we had the big turnouts in Chicago and LA mm -hmm. and Seattle, but you know, a reporter called me the day after from Fort Myers, Florida, and said, Professor Ortiz, can you explain to me why we had 75,000 Latinos in the streets of Fort Myers, Florida yesterday? I said, you had 75,000 in Fort Myers? Wow. Amazing. Another, a bit of a review. Yesterday, the theme was the Mexican War of Independence and the importance of the Mexican War of Independence in U.S. history, on U.S. history. And we talked about the effort that Mexican freedom fighters made to try to get James, people like James Madison, people who have been veterans of the American Revolution, to join Mexican people. Um, we also talked about the fact that in Mexico, their War of Revolution or the War of Independence is very much from the, from the outset, from military necessity, an anti-slavery war, a war to try to abolish caste distinctions, uh, caste distinctions that, that really uh, cripple indigenous people, uh, and to re recruit any army of any size that would stay in the field, this is what people like Morelos um, did. In other words, again, they had to learn by experience to create a successful insurrection against the mother country. Um, you have to enlist people at the bottom of the base, people who normally are not seen as political actors. We talked a lot about imperialism, why it matters, why it's important. People like William Appleman Williams, Walter Lefebvre, I mean, uh, Howard Zinn, I mean, the generations of writers, uh, writers from the Latin American diaspora, um, why imperialism is important to understand as a main theme in American history. You know, I talked about social movements, grassroots insurgencies, um, uh, democratic struggles, but also from above, the attempt to, to enlarge the U.S. primarily in the 19th century through, through slavery. 
And in the early 20th century, the reconfiguration of what we call racial capitalism becomes more about invading, uh, sending U.S. troops into, like myself, uh, into countries like Panama or, or Honduras or Nicaragua or, or the Dominican Republic. This is the table of contents. So yesterday of, of the book, the forthcoming book, so yesterday we mainly talked about the first four chapters. Today we'll, we'll wrap up the book. Um, and I'll spend probably most of the time talking about chapter five, waging war on the government of American banks, because we've got a lot of questions uh, in that. Uh, Troy Reeves will like this. The last chapter is heavily based on world histories, talking to, and again, a lot of Latino workers who participated in a day without Mexicans or a day without immigrants to get their thoughts and their ideas. Why are you going out on strike? Why are you foregoing a day or two or three days worth of wages? Why are you risking your livelihoods to engage in this mass action? You know, what is it that you're hoping to achieve through through doing this? But the title, Killing, Killing Killed Helping Workers to Organize, is something that, that just jumped out at me in doing this research for the book. Can anyone tell me who that, who this person is in this image and what this might mean? Maybe some of the, the symbolism here. Just kind of, there's no wrong answers. <laughs> who is this gentleman in the forefront? Very good, Martin Luther King Jr. And how is the image framed? You see Dr. King in the forefront. Um, what are some other kind of visual clues as to how he's being framed? What, what, do you, what is the artist trying to depict here? Is it something of uh, seeing the parallel of uh, this newspaper. It's, it's a, you know, it's a Latino issue, but uh, put in a Negro to tell the story. Yeah. Is there something in there? If, if you can read the date, you're absolutely correct. This is April 15th, 1968. Uh, this is no more than two weeks after Dr. King was assassinated. And there were so many efforts to try to, to explain his. Uh, the murder of Dr. King, what he stood for, what his death meant. So this is meaning framed by the main newspaper of the United Farm Workers. Anyone who speaks Spanish want to give us the meaning of El Mar Marcarado? <laughs> uh, badly raised, usually used to sort of like tell a little kid who's misbehaving. Yeah, these are the troublemakers. This is the Farm Workers Union. This is the United Farm Workers. Uh, <coughs> co-founded by Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. So they're troublemakers. This is the title of their newsletter, their newspaper. They're the first, one among the first groups to respond to Dr. King's death. And this is how they frame his death. Today we frame it in many different ways. I have many students at the University of Florida when I tell them, did you know that Dr. King died in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, supporting the Memphis sanitation workers strike? They look at me like I'm from another universe. They said, we never knew that. No one ever told us that he was involved in the labor movement. But right here, right at the moment, he, he, he just two weeks after he passes away, the United Farm Workers Movement, composed primarily of Filipino and Latino farm workers, uh, and some African Americans and some white farm workers, they right away are framing the meaning of his life, Dr. King's life, and the meaning of his death as a labor organizer involved in labor struggle killed helping workers to organize. Now who gets killed helping workers to organize in the United States in the 1960s? The UFW has several individuals who were uh, murdered or killed organizing in the 1960s. So, it's, so that whole notion um, of martyrdom is very important. But again, what I want us to think about here is how looking at American history from this perspective is again looking at it from the perspective of people in struggle people trying to change the system, people who normally are marginalized, who are seen as having no power whatsoever, troublemakers, badly raised, marginal people. But here they're reclaiming a kind of iconography 
and really setting a framework for how this most significant person, probably most <coughs> significant American of the 20th century, uh, lived and how he passed away. And the whole newspaper, the whole newsletter, by the way, has different stories about Dr. King talking about um, different aspects of his life. Dr. King is a man of peace, as a person who comes out against the Vietnam War, uh, as a person who helped to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. You know, different, he even excerpts his I Have a Dream speech. So in other words, it doesn't compartmentalize him and tries to deal with him whole in a way that I've never, ever before seen, even in an academic publication, because academics usually try to kind of split up his life in, in, in certain ways. Yesterday we talked about how when we re-envision American history from an African-American Latinx perspective, racism and race relations aren't just a black and white matter. So this is a very iconic image of segregation. Danny Lyon, who took the photograph, was worked with SNCC. Uh, he's a famous photographer. He worked with people like Bob Fitch, Gordon Park, some of the great kind of social photographers of the 20th century. This is how I teach segregation when I work actually with middle school students. In fact, a lot of these slides are from workshops um, that I, I use when I'm, I'm working doing community educational work. Um, what does this tell us about segregation? <laughs> yeah, I mean that the premise of segregation was Supreme Court separate and but we've seen, as we saw yesterday, all throughout the United States, segregation was about more than black and white. So these were signs, and I showed you one yesterday that my father grew up with in Houston, Texas. Uh, this is in South Florida in 19, the 1940s. And again, these were, were pervasive throughout the landscape. If you're familiar with a man by the name of Stetson Kennedy, one of the great investigative journalists of the 20th century. Stetson actually put that, this photograph, on the front cover of his book, Jim Crow Guy, was not able to get anyone in the United States to touch the book. Couldn't get anyone to publish it, had to go to France. His line editor was... Right, and Simone de Beauvoir, yeah. Um, so anyway, racial capitalism. We talked about racial capitalism yesterday. And, and capitalism and slavery is really making a big comeback. And so in the early, early in the 20th century, we would read people like C.L.R. James, Oliver Cox, um, we would read Eric Williams. Now that discourse about the connections between capitalism and slavery are coming back together. Cedric Robinson teaches us, though, that racial capitalism doesn't just end when slavery ends, that racial capitalism moves on, it reconfigures itself. So in the early 20th century, even though slavery is supposed to have ended in the American South, it continues. And we know this by studying the convict lease, by studying debt peonage. This form of trafficking in African American and Mexican workers was very common in the American South. Actually, I should say in the, in the, in the Sun Belt, all the way from Florida to Southern California. This is what working people had to deal with. Um, and it was a very powerful system because law enforcement was very often tied up in it. So in this particular case, you have county sheriffs, law enforcement, who get kickbacks uh, for um, literally de uh, delivering workers to plantation owners, to phosphate mine owners, to... How, how many of you have seen the updated version of the Magnificent Seven with Denzel Washington? Anyone here? That whole film was framed around um, debt peonage and the Covid lease. It's a very interesting film to check out. But anyway, this is racial capitalism in the early 20th century. This is what it becomes, a system of, of, of enforced labor for profit. So racial capitalism isn't capitalism and something else. It's simply looking at capitalism kind of more holistically. So the government of American banks, we, we, we previewed it yesterday. And this is one snapshot in which W.E.B. Du Bois, how many of you have heard of W.E.B. Du Bois, by the way? Very good. All right, we're doing a good job here. Um, one of the most important thinkers in American history, 
in the 1928 National Convention of the NAACP, he's talking about why we as Negro people have to fight to get the vote back, fight to get the ballot back. We have to fight to get it back because, this, because when we were disenfranchised, it enabled a level of corruption, political corruption, economic corruption, and social corruption such as never been seen anywhere in the advanced world. And what year did you just say? This is this was a speech that Du Bois gave in 1928. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, how did he get that tension? Du Bois. Oh, it's a family. David Levering Lewis has a two-volume biography on him, <laughs> and I can give you the citation. Right. I, it's kind of. But um. But in the speech, it, you know, it's a longer speech. And I excerpt it here. What I want you to again connect is that he's talking about why we have to get the ballot back for black people here in the United States, but how this is connected to American imperialism abroad. They're, what they suffer abroad because of Western imperialism, because what France, the United States, Great Britain, so on and so forth do, is visited upon us. And for us, for us to challenge the system of global imperialism, we have to regain the right to, to vote. Uh, and here you see him pictured um, we, you know, we talked yesterday about James Olden Johnson and his famous expose of the American occupation of Haiti uh, that he published in 1922 uh, in The Nation uh, and in the, uh, the Crisis. I talked yesterday about this concept called emancipatory internationalism. And what we mean by this is this is a philosophy or an ideal which is essentially says my freedom and your freedom are connected. If you're not free, I cannot be free. And this is one of the most important ideas in African American history. We can trace it, we can find it, we can look at its origins, we can see how, again, like um, other <coughs> types of ideas, to paraphrase Edward W. Said, it travels over time. So in the early 19th century, emancipatory internationalism is involved in a critique against plantation slavery. In the early 20th century, it's involved in a critique of new, modern kind of U.S. imperialism. If you're familiar with Latin American history, you know who this gentleman is. Um, and I mentioned yesterday, when I fought in Central America, I saw images of Augusto Sandino everywhere, so ubiquitous, so, so common, I thought he was still alive. I, I really did. Um, and, but in many ways, he was still alive. You know, he had such a such such a such an impact, not just in Latin America, but in the United States. And so, what I learned in looking at correspondence in black uh, among black editors, black labor organizers here, the Pittsburgh Courier, which was one of the most popular black newspapers in the early 20th and mid late 20th century, is that when the U.S. invaded Central America in the 1920s. From the perspective of the New York Times, that was a good thing. Those people were not prepared for civilization. They needed our uplift. They needed our help. Uh, we needed to intervene to bring them up to our level of civilization. Mm -hmm. But when you read African American newspapers, they had exactly the opposite critique. And, and the critique is very pointed. And basically, it says that there's nothing to be proud about in these invasions of of Central American, Latin American, Caribbean countries. In fact, as the Norfolk Journal and Guide says, we should be ashamed. So if you call this a victory, the victory of the U.S. Marines, the victory of our fighting forces over the Nicaraguan rebels may, may have been a fine achievement for the military, but it is nothing to reflect credit upon our country's Latin American policy. In fact, it is rather discredit, indeed a disgrace. Now imagine a, US, a mainstream U.S. New, newspaper today using this kind of discourse about U.S. occupation of Afghanistan. I don't think you'd find it in the New York Times. But again, the Times, the black press is dueling with the New York Times, with the Chicago Tribune, with the major kind of northern big newspapers about imperialism. And the northern newspapers, of course, New York Times can always be dependent upon to support U.S. intervention in Latin America, and Kirtman is mad, shaking his head. Uh, it's always at the forefront. Uh, it's always manufacturing incredible data at a certain moment, and then maybe three or four or five years later, 
It says, well, we, we regret we made a mistake. It's a retraction. We're going to publish a retraction. But not at the time of, of the invasion. So I'm going to fast forward here because we want to get to Q&A, but um, now we're moving forward in, in time. Remember we talked yesterday about time travel and trying to re-envision uh, 250 or so years of American history takes a little bit of that, um, uh, that, that time travel. So now we're moving into the 90s, but also what I talk about in the final chapter in my argument that it is working class power at the, at, at the grassroots, which really makes the election of President Barack Obama possible in 2008. How I justify this in the book is based on a certain uh, experience I had in, during the spring Democratic primaries. Um, I was interviewed as part of a panel for a, a Bay Area um, a forum on the election, on, on the, the Democratic primary that was in, then in progress. And I was asked about, you know, who do you think, the, uh, you know, who do you think Latinos in, out West are going to support, uh, then Senator Clinton or Senator Obama? And I got up and I talked all about the history of the Clinton's involvement with, you know, Latinos in the past. And I said, well, you know, Senator Obama is very popular among Latinos and Puerto Ricans and, and, and Mexican people in, in Chicago and some Midwestern cities, but he doesn't really have that much experience out West. So I'm going to go with Clinton. The next morning, I got a call from a friend in Las Vegas, and he said, I just want to let you know that the Culinary Workers Local 226, the president just endorsed Senator Obama. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, man. Why didn't you tell me yesterday? <laughs> I just made a fool of myself on, 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 on national radio. Um, because when the Culinary Workers endorsed President Obama, that meant six, a union of 60,000 people went into action. And within a period of two or three days, the next domino was the LA County Federation of Labor, which was headed by Maria Elena Torasso, who grew up in the United Farm Workers Union. Her parents were organizers with the United Farm Workers. Remember how we started with them depicting Dr. King, honoring him, paying homage to him. The next domino was the, the Bay Area Federation of Labor and then the Seattle, and then the Portland Fed, and all these enormous labor federations in the, in, in, at West began endorsing Senator Obama, and then basically the race is over, because 60,000 people in the union is just a fraction of the amount of influence the union has at the base. If you know anything about, about American politics, um, who are the people who actually get out the vote now? Go door to door, make the phone calls, canvas, put up signs. They're people in the unions. This union has an incredible history, which I will I can only kind of glance on here, but I wrote a piece in Truth Out in 2013, shortly after President Obama traveled to Las Vegas to make a signature speech, actually the signature speech of his, of his presidential career on immigration. And again, people ask me, why is he going to Las Vegas? And I said, this is why he's going to Las Vegas. This is his base. This is his strength. Um, you don't know the names of any of these women or any of these union members, but they hail from 84 different <coughs> countries on the face of the planet. And I argue that this is the future of American politics. I mean, there, there, are different, there, there are different futures, but this is one possible future. This union, by the way, uh, is negotiating with none other than Donald Trump who they say has refused to negotiate with them. They have called a national boycott of Donald Trump until he negotiates a union contract with them in one of the large Las Vegas hotels. So that drama is still playing out. But I learned about this union when I was a younger labor organizer. They went out on strike, I talked to you a little bit about the frontier strike, eight years, not a single person, not a single woman, 600 women, not a single one crossed the picket line. It was an epic labor battle. But at the, they started with like you know 20,000 members. At the end, they end up with 60,000, and begin to exert a larger than life impact on American uh, politics. Again, getting us closer to the present. This is a lot of material that's in my final chapter. Is looking at um, uh, Latinx workers in different places. So here, meat packers, who are, as we know are kind of you know, reshaping the meatpacking industry both in the Midwest but also in the South. 
this was a struggle that some of my students were involved in. Um, some of my former students as labor organizers. This was a walkout that took, took place, by the way, led by African-American and Latinx workers. Latino workers were, were requested to have Martin Luther King Day as a paid holiday. Uh, their supervisors told them, you don't know anything about Martin Luther King. Uh, he doesn't have anything to do with you. Uh, you know, he was a black man, right? Uh, we want to separate you, keep blacks and Latinos separate. You know, you, don't you have your own people to celebrate? And they said, we know who Dr. King is. We can, we can cite you chapter and verse. We know who he is, and we have a, a certain kind of interpretation of his life, why he's important to us as new immigrant workers. And so we demand the right to celebrate his life, to commemorate his life, not just to go home and hang out, but to actually participate in homage to Dr. King. And so um, the Smithfield campaign, which I, I talk about in my final chapter, is a long and bitter union campaign. There are uh, three or four different unsuccessful votes. They finally voted to unionize, I think in 2014. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's an example of contemporary political organizing at the grassroots, which relies heavily on connecting and linking to, the, to history, to kind of a historical memory uh, of struggle. Another event, you um, mentioned earlier Cinco de Mayo. Um, there are efforts all across the country to creatively reimagine holidays like Cinco like Juneteenth. This was one of them. And this was an effort, you have to organize these things. They don't just happen organically, they don't just happen automatically. But when we were in North Carolina, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, when I was a grad student at Duke actually, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee had organized a boycott of Mount Olive Pickles in an effort to, to, to get a union election for the workers in the cucumber harvest. Uh, the company refused to allow them to vote for a union of their own choice, and so they called a boycott of the company until it agreed to allow them to vote for a union, or not for a union. Um, and so in 2001, Juneteenth was reimagined as an inclusive holiday which incorporates both black history but also Latino history. Does anyone know, what is Juneteenth? I, I should preface by asking that question. Does anyone know what Juneteenth was or what it is? It's very big in Texas, very big in the South. It may not be very big up here. Celebrates Emancipation Proclamation. Celebrates Emancipation. And it has special meaning in Texas because in, in, in all throughout the South, um, you can imagine if you were a plantation owner Emancipation is announced. You're going to try to keep that news secret. You don't want your slave workers to know that they're now ostensibly free. So Juneteenth commemorates the, the, the point in which enslaved people, African Americans in Texas, discover they're free, hence Juneteenth. So Juneteenth has made a big comeback in, in not just black communities, but also uh, Mexican American communities are beginning to celebrate it in the Southwest as well. So this is a creative reconfiguration of Juneteenth to, to again, be um, a, a holiday which celebrates not just one emancipation, but different emancipations. And not just a historical commemoration, but incorporating new demands. So here it's a living wage for all workers, language and culture rights, the rights of workers to organize into unions. And this is simply from um, a, a broadside and the news release from this event, uh, which occurred in, in Juneteenth of 2001. There's a lot of literature. I mean, when we talk about comparing African-American and Latinx mm -hmm. histories, um, again, yeah, I, I tried to emphasize this yesterday. I'll emphasize it today. Uh, I'm not the first to do this. I'm drawing on a tremendous uh, historical tradition of scholars who have always thought comparatively not only about ethnic history, but about imperialism, about the development of the United States. For many people in the movement who were uh, a generation ahead of me, and then in my generation, in the late 80s, these were the types of books you read to understand how the empire had been put together. 
and we read these books because we wanted to find out how to create democratic movements and how to emancipate people, kind of where we were in the late 1980s. But you had to understand how the system worked. Um, and where did you go? You went to Galliano, you went to, uh, to Walter Rodney. Both of them, by the way, exiled from their own native countries um, and, and, and having to write about imperialism uh, away from their home places, uh, if you will. Again, the, the traveling, the migration, the refugee kind of experience. In, in, in the book, I actually don't write a lot about the 1960s, and the reason that I don't and I, I haven't heard anything, um, my editor hasn't critiqued me on this yet, and my, my readers haven't said much, but my premise is that the 60s is one, the one decade that people have written a lot about, you know, in terms of anti-imperialism, in terms of, of different freedom movements, um, but there are moments which I think are very important, and so in, in, in the 1960s, um, you have students, like your, your peers in the 1960s, we're trying to create connections in this case, a connection between the Mexican Revolution and between the anti-colonial movement in Africa. So, so bringing together people, Patricia Mumba and Noyana Zapata, who normally you wouldn't see in the same kind of imaginary, kind of intellectual space, but in, in, with insurgent students who are fighting for the right to study Mexican history, African history, Chicano history, they're bringing these characters into, in, in, into dialogue with each other and, and saying this, you know, this is part of our history. Uh, this is why it's important, this is why uh, it matters. And then to kind of wrap up, um, these are just some of, a, a few of the takeaways in writing the book that I'm hoping to really get across to readers. And when I look back, you know, rereading William Appleton Williams, uh, Du Bois, Galliano, Ernesto Galarza, and others, all I'm trying to do is put new material, you know, some, some of the research is original in the book. A lot of it, obviously, is secondary. It's going back over the, some classic texts and trying to infuse American history or study of American history uh, with these texts and to suggest a different way of looking at U.S. history, not just as a society which is created from a European background and where everyone else has to assimilate to that. Uh, I don't think that's an accurate story. I, I find as much intellectual, political, economic, and social influence from Latin America in the United States, um, and a lot from Africa too as well, I know there's a lot from Asia, but that's not my daily way. Uh, that, that's, and other people have written, uh, written very well about that. But again, I find as much influence and impact from the global south, if you will, particularly the Latin, Latin American Caribbean, on the development of the United States over the long term period of time, from the colonial period to present, as I do from Europe. And so that's one of the ways that I try to resituate. American history is not just an east-west story, but a north-south story. And again, newer and older scholars have done that quite well. What I'm trying to do is try to synthesize a lot of that work um, and fit it into you know, the, the, the two and a half or three centuries that I'm trying to cover uh, in the book. And then most importantly, at the bottom, using history as, as a way of reminding every one of us that if we're going to create change in the society, it, create, it, it begins where we are. The importance of social movement building, uh, the importance of organizing, of democracy organizing. Again, the idea the more active people are, the more active, the more, the more we can get things done. But if we rely on others to, uh, to do it for us, it, it's not going to get done. Now, there are just a few images. Um, I just have to share this because this, this always sparks another discussion. But in the late 19th century, um, Reverend Lena Mason was a very prominent Methodist minister. And in the earlier chapter, um, there's a lot, I show a lot of people talking about these great anti colonial struggles in Cuba and other countries. And I want to kind of remind us that these critiques of colonialism are always generated by grassroots social movements. So Du Bois wrote this great book, Black Reconstruction. 
when I first read that book, I thought, wow, Du Bois is a really smart person. Dang, he was really smart. That's amazing. How could he have done that? As I studied him more and more, I realized that he's simply drawn from a long intellectual and social movement tradition to write black reconstruction. When I started reading about you know, black anti-colonialism in, 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 in Latin America that shows up in these newspapers, I realized that it isn't just the writers who are, who are reacting, they're responding to the Universal Negro Improvement Association, or UNIA. How many of you have heard of Marcus Garvey? Okay, so a few. So in the early 20s, throughout much of the 20s in fact, UNIA is a thing. It is the largest black political organization in American history. It has chapters in 40 different countries that we can find so far. In fact, I, I, my suspicion is that we're going to double that number when we continue our research. Many of the leaders of those local UNIA chapters from, and there was a chapter in Fort Scott, there's, a cha there's several chapters in Miami, there's a chapter in Madison, there's chapters in Seattle, there are chapters in Cuba, there are chapters in the French Caribbean, uh, there are chapters in Brazil. Those chapters are worldwide, and they're the ones really pushing the idea of global integration of the ideas of freedom. When we think of global integration today, I mean, think about this. We often think about the negative impacts of global integration. That became a major discourse during our recently concluded election. People talked about global integration as causing competition, you know, outsourcing, um, tensions, lowering of wages. But the ways in which African Americans and Latinx people, with the way they imagine global integration in the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries is very different. It's much more positive. It's much more, what can we do to help each other? What can we do to help each other's freedom struggles? Not how can we monetize, not how can we take advantage of, but how can we actually kind of lift each other up? And it's not, you know, it's not perfect. Um, and again, I'm a living exemplar of that. I was a soldier for empire in an earlier phase of life. Um, but when you, when you look at groups like the Universal Negro Improvement Association, you realize that they're talking about our freedom in Fort Scott, Kansas is connected to the freedom of people in Cuba. So anyway, I'll go ahead and um, wrap up on that. And if there are any uh, questions or comments or uh, thoughts, and thanks again for your patience. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll continue to work on the historical journey part, I guess. Uh, tomorrow as well. Yes. Has the United States tolerated illegal immigration since the 1960s because of the benefits of cheap labor? Well, there has always been um, movement of peoples. I mean, my family, I mentioned yesterday, came to the U.S. in 1914. From Mexico. There was a border, uh, there were check stations. I don't recall hearing about any problems we had coming to the United States in 1914 or a family. But people have been moving uh, in, 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 in different ways. I remember yesterday though, what's different about movement in the 19th century is that the United States is trying to stop people primarily from leaving the United States and going to Mexico. Why? Who are those people trying to leave the United States and go to Mexico in like the 1840s, 1850s? They're runaway slaves. I mean, that's the original creation of the, of the U.S.-Mexican border. It's a border to keep people in, to keep people from, from, from finding freedom, both, of course, in Mexico, but also in Canada. And by the way, when did Britain, when did, when did the British Empire abolish slavery? The 1830s. So this creates a tremendous pressure on the United States of America because not only does Mexico abolish slavery, Canada doesn't have slavery, and then when, when the British Empire abolishes slavery, and then the French, man, imagine what it was like to try to hold down the U.S. Empire when all these nations around you are abolishing slavery. So now we understand that Florida served as a conduit for people fleeing to freedom to the Bahamas 
And in, in the University of Florida Oral History Project, we have interviewed descendants of those early freedom fighters, people who escaped through the Everglades in the 1840s and ended up living in the Bahamas and actually creating vi very vibrant communities that exist to this day. But they see their families as rooted or based originally in like Florida or in, in the United States. In Mexico, I mentioned yesterday the Black Seminoles, when they left Florida, some of them went to Oklahoma, to Indian Territory, most of them left immediately because they could see what a ghastly situation they were being put in. And where did they end up? Mexico, Canada, uh, Brazil. Uh, some of them worked as border guards for Mexico, <coughs> but some of them also served as cavalry scouts for the United States Cavalry. Again, a lot of paradoxes and contradictions. But the history of the U.S.-Mexico border is incredibly complicated, much more complicated than I think was, was reflected in a recent uh, political election. But originally that border is created not to keep people out, but to keep them in, to keep them, uh, to keep them in bondage, essentially. So Paul, uh, you alluded to the fact that your last chapter included some oral history, but I wonder just in general how being an oral historian or doing oral history helps influence your research in general when you do something like this. Well, it's a great question. Um, really, it's, it's oral history that's, that led me to do this book, even though, you know, ironically, most of the book is not based on oral history. But talking to, you know, in my own family, you know, talking to elders, and asking them basic questions like, you know, how do we get here? What were your aspirations? Um, my grandfather was an oiler for the Southern Pacific Railroad. And I never had the, the honor of actually knowing him. He passed away before I, before I was born. Um, but if, you, if you're familiar with the labor history, um, an oil, oiler for the railroad was someone who literally went under a railroad engine and oiled some 150 to 160 unique oil points in, under the chassis. And it was an incredibly dangerous job. So I've talked to some of my, I was able to talk to two great uncles about my grandfather. And, you know, the fact that he survived for as long as he did without being killed, because many men were killed doing that job, because the, you know, you, you had to literally jack up this, this, this several ton engine, and sometimes it would fall, right? It would crush people. But he was also a very strong union member. And that union allowed him a level of economic security to where he was able to buy a house. Not a very big house, but a house nonetheless. And so I, you know, talking to people in my family taught me how, you know, change happens. Uh, but that, but the other thing is that we could never depend upon the state employers to do the right thing. Grandpa had to be in a union. They had to be willing to go out on strike if they wanted to have a decent wage and a decent living condition. And so in doing labor history, as a labor historian in, in, in later years, that lesson was, was taught to me over and over and over again, right? Um, interviewing steel workers in the upper Midwest, they, they would say, well, we got our health care during the three years, you know, during the, the three month strike in the 50s, we got our pensions during this strike, we got, you know, in other words, I was learning how change happens and how people never give you anything. The government never gave us anything that we didn't earn and fight for and die for. And that's what I learned through oral history. And so, so learning that in the more recent decades, I could take those lessons back into, you know, into the early 20th century and the 19th century where I obviously could talk to people. Well, uh, do, I, do I sense one of the conclusions or perhaps subtext of your presentation is one of optimism, which we might need nowadays, because as you look at history, you see seemingly powerless people organized, and we know power adheres in organizations, um, making some significant changes. Um, and uh, uh, I think people need to know how we got from there to here, yeah. and if you look at history through a series of self-movements, labor movement, 
environmental movement, civil rights movement, anti-child labor movement, you go on and on, the goals were accomplished. And so in an age where we, I think some folks are feeling some powerlessness, this is one lesson. So I, I, I'm sensing some optimism from your, your presentation. I'm trying to be optimistic. Um, but no, I think that that's very fair. I mean, I think what I'm trying to do in the book is to suggest that everything that we, we have and we think we have came about through struggle, right? Um, we can lose it. We can lose it really quickly. Like, I have to explain in the book why we lost the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a devastating blow. Um, and we have to kind of, I, I kind of think of, one of my models as a writer was from Melville because Melville has this, this magnificent novel about people that work in a whaling ship, and he's trying to show that, you know, he's trying to show the nobility of labor, of people at the bottom of the ship, right? Literally, people that work in a hole. And he's trying to show that the people who are in charge of the ship, not just Captain Ahab, we know Captain Ahab is a nut, but who, who, are, the board of who are members of the Board of Trustees for the Pequot? They knew this guy. They allowed him to take a vessel full of, of men out onto the sea to drown them. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, um, yes, I see when I look at history and look at my own family history, the history of, of imperialism, the struggle against imperialism, I do see well, I do see gains that have been made, but at the same time, we I don't I try to avoid kind of um, you know what, what William William Appleton Williams would have called kind of a wig view of history. Like things don't automatically get better unless we push for them to get better. Uh, we can't rely on people. It's like someone was uh, wrote a piece for the New York Times yesterday and they said they counterposed Facebook with Thomas Jefferson. And they said the problem with our democracy now is it relies too much on Facebook and not enough on the ideas of Thomas Jefferson. I would never have written that piece because the people that I write about had a very different viewpoint of Thomas Jefferson, right? They're, they're people who see Jefferson, number one, as a slaveholder, number two, as a person who refused to support the Mexican War of Independence. So they have a very different view of him. So I know if, if, that makes, if that makes sense. Power surrenders nothing without a struggle. Frederick Douglass, he, he shows them all, all over, yes. Yes. Paul, well, thanks so much for your talk, sir. I couldn't make it yesterday. Uh, my name is David Sajnani. I'm a professor of hip hop studies in the African Cultural Studies Department here. I'm also a new professor, so let me introduce myself to the students uh, who are here. Take um, his classes. Next That's semester, next All semester, right. I'm teaching uh, a cross-listed undergraduate graduate course called "The Trouble with Whiteness." So we're going to talk about critical whiteness studies, which all of a sudden has, if, if it wasn't, uh, you know, important enough. Uh, it's now just become uh, that much more crucial uh, to have these kind of discussions as of a week ago. So I appreciate your, uh, your talk and maybe just uh, um, to push a little bit more about this optimism, pessimism question that's been brought up. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so you use this uh, 1928 quote from Du Bois, why we got to get back um, the... Uh, the vote, but then, of course, we also have to reckon with his 1956 statement um, yeah. saying, no way I'm going to vote right. in the United States because there isn't a lesser of two evils, to paraphrase, there's only a more effective of two evils. Um, and, and he uh, leaves. And he leaves. He's in yeah. Africa, 1963. Yeah. 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 yeah, in Ghana. Um, so, so there's that, uh, but but he doesn't leave the struggle. Importantly, he doesn't leave right. the struggle. And I appreciate this uh, this term that you use. I use it. I, I, I use the concept in my work, not the term, which I've just been introduced to. But what did you call it? Um, uh, international anti-imperialism. What, what did you? Emancipatory. Emancipatory internationalism. Yeah. So I appreciate that, uh, and uh, and it's useful to my work. But so what I want to ask you about is. Um, you're talking about how change happens through social movement. This is the theme of the book. And, uh, and you, I noticed that you use the word change in the shorthand version of how we use it, of what we mean by you know, whatever is progressive change. But of course, uh, there's also other kinds of change. Right. Um, and uh, I wonder if you would see the selection of uh, the president elect as. Uh, as also as a social movement, right? So what does that mean about social movement theory, populism, uh, the fact that uh, that a majority 
uh, can vote for uh, and can be complicit in very regressive politics. Right. I mean, it's a great. Is that question. still a social movement? Yeah. I mean, you have, and in, in, in certainly in the study in Latin American history and African history um, <coughs> and U.S. history and or, European history. and European history, right? And yes, social movements can be right-wing movements, they can be left-wing movements, they can be any kind of movement, really. Um, in the 19th century, in, in the early 20th century, I have one chapter in the early 20th century which is basically talking about the reconfiguration of racial capitalism. Yeah. How it is that the United States can kind of, how the status quo can come together at the end of slavery and essentially impose a system which is not slavery any longer, but is still incredibly ex, uh, exploited, yeah. right? And they can't just do that from above. There has to be activity and support from enough people at the base of the society. You talk about whiteness. Okay. So in California, and again, this is what I've learned from reading the secondary literature, Alexander Saxton, um, you know, the Rise of the White Republic, Theodore Allen, that amazing work from California, a lot of it, by the way, which is focusing on the creation of an independent labor movement in California, which is actually explicitly anti-Chinese and anti-black. Yep. And it, 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 labor politics, Alexander Saxon taught us in California for a long period of time, were you know, hinged upon this notion of white male suffrage and citizenship, which, um, would not accept Chinese membership into the union, or even into into voting, yeah. right? And so, yeah, you can have those different. Uh, now, I haven't updated the book yet to reflect yeah. the election of Donald Trump. Um, I'm already over and, my. And word. Why would you have yeah. thought about doing <laughs> yeah. that? You know, up to a week ago. I'm already over my word limit. So, <laughs> those of you that know the politics of word limits with books, we'll, we'll, <laughs> I can't go back, I'm already well over my word limits. I'm sure you use the best words. <laughs> try to, try to. But, but again, I, I do talk about the rise in the 1980s, this, again, reconfiguration of status quo politics, the decline of unionism, the movement of people into a, a kind of politics which is a, a modern politics of disenfranchisement. I mean, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, that term. Yes, yes. And again, the oral histories, because in the UF oral history program, and many others across the country, I know I know Troy Reeves has, has, has um, facilitated these interviews as well. I mean, we interviewed people who fought and risked their lives for the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And yet we've lived through this situation where essentially the U.S. Supreme Court has eviscerated yep. the Voting Rights Act. And so again, it's a reminder that we hope for, for positive changes. We hope for a world which is better for our children and our grandchildren. Um, but after last Tuesday, the hardest call I had to make was to my father. Um, I showed you that sign. No Negroes, no dogs, no Mexicans. So I have to call my father, who grew up with that sign, and explain to him what my generation did to elect a person who, who participates in those politics. I have family in Mexico, and so I'm like, the, the, the insults, the degradation. Um, to me, it was easier to talk to my students than to talk to elders, and thank God I didn't have to talk to my great grandma because she would have said, what is wrong with you? You, we fought so hard for just a small space, a small opening in the society, and what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, really? Um, so, yeah, it, it's, 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 but it's that moment where organizing, I think, um, is more important than ever, wherever you are at. Um, <coughs> 